Welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Vinita Sondi from Vivekanand College and I will be taking up module 1, Introduction to Criminal Investigation. Let us first begin with a brief introduction to criminal investigation. Criminal investigation involves the use of scientific methods and principles to collect various kinds of evidences with the goal of establishing the series of events surrounding the crime and eventually solving it. Criminal investigators are aware of the fact that not even a single innocent person should be falsely implicated and miscarriage of justice should not occur. The area is highly complex, requiring trained and committed professionals from various fields. The actual crime itself may take place within minutes or sometimes seconds, but the planning that may have gone behind it may have taken months or even years. There are victims, witnesses and suspects in this entire scenario and the legal rights need to be upheld at all stages. There are certain learning outcomes that I expected out of the module. Upon completion of the module, students will be able to understand the objectives of criminal investigation, describe the modes of criminal investigation, discuss the multidisciplinary nature of the team, describe the skills required for criminal investigation, develop some insight into the kinds of evidence used in criminal investigation, Describe the procedures of crime scene investigation. Now let us discuss what are the objectives of criminal investigation. Crime investigation is inherently a very complex process. There are various objectives of criminal investigation as given by Lyman in 2011. First, to establish that crime has been committed. Second, to identify the perpetrator of the crime. Third, to document and preserve all evidence in crimes. Next, to prosecute the perpetrator of the crime and to recover property that has been stolen during the theft. We also need to ensure that justice will be carried out by preparing a sound criminal case for prosecution. The underlying assumption behind any crime is that while committing a crime, the perpetrator is likely to make an error. He may leave some evidence behind on the scene in the form of hair, a piece of clothing, fingerprints, a witness who has a glimpse of him, etc. This evidence that he has left behind plays an important role in later investigations. The extent of the investigation depends on many factors including the nature of crime and resources available. Lyman 2011 has classified these resources in three categories. Eyewitness resources technological resources for collection and preservation of physical evidence, resources developed as a result of training and experience investigative techniques, eyewitness resources, technological resources for collection and preservation of physical evidence, resources developed as a result of training and experience investigative techniques. Often, two types of modes of investigations have been differentiated. The first approach is the reactive approach to investigation which occurs when a police responds to a crime that has already taken place such as murder or theft. The second approach is the proactive approach to investigation which occurs in response to an ongoing criminal activity or even before the crime has been committed. For example, the police may get information that a gang is going to commit a crime in a particular area. In other cases, the police may patrol an area which they think is very prone to crimes based on past crime rates. Proactive investigation is more effective because the investigators control the investigation and the suspects do not know how or where they are being investigated. The crime scene investigation team is multidisciplinary. Various academic disciplines contribute to criminal investigation. Law helps investigators in understanding and interpretation of laws. Psychologists improve the understanding of the behaviors of the suspects, witnesses, bystanders, juries and others 
especially in the field of eyewitness testimony and in cognitive interviewing. Criminology analyzes crime trends. It helps crime scene investigators to understand as to why crime occurs and how society responds to it. Criminal justice analyzes the various systems associated with criminal justice works. This includes the police systems, prison systems, court systems, etc. The contribution of psychology is not to be undermined. It studies the role of policing in society and how it influences societies and communities. Media studies understands how various systems involved in this entire process are portrayed in the media. Science, technology and engineering are helpful in applying tools and techniques for gathering, analyzing and interpreting the data from the crime scene. Medicine is helpful in forensic medical examination. The skills that investigators require can be categorized in many ways. First type of skills are technology skills. The techniques used to solve a crime range from the very complex to very simple. Knowledge about computers and related technologies is an absolute must in today's electronic era. For example, an examination of digital media can reveal internet activity, journals, videos or audio recordings. Sometimes there are hidden or deleted files. There are sophisticated technologies available to improve the quality of audio and video recordings if they are not clear and also access the hidden deleted files. Mobile phones are commonly used even in remote towns of India. Cellular tower data is available to law enforcement agencies and can provide information about the location of a particular suspect or victim. Another technology which is commonly used nowadays is CCTV footage. Cameras can be found on roads, educational institutes, railway stations, airports, shops and even outside houses. Technology is also used for analyzing fingerprints, palm prints and even at times bare footprints. DNA analysis is also now regularly conducted and may lead to a single source profile or a mixture. Similarly, there are sophisticated technologies for analyzing other biological evidence such as food, blood, semen, tissue, saliva, urine, hair and fingernails. Automated ballistics technology too has become mainstream and cases that were earlier thought to be unsolvable can now be solved. These are only a few technologies that are commonly used in crime scene investigation. Similarly, there are technologies for photographing the scene, collecting evidence and recording evidence. Knowledge about all these technologies would help in crime scene investigation, though only experts would have specialized knowledge in a particular field. The second type of skills are people skills. People are the focus in any criminal investigation. Having good communication skills, Patience, empathy, active listening skills, good problem solving skills, persuasive skills, negotiation skills, leadership skills, presentation skills and motivational skills are of great essence. The third type of skills are managerial skills. Solving a case involves a lot of managerial skills. These skills range from managing the material collected, networking with other teams, team coordination, allocating tasks to team members, recording and integration of data, etc. The fourth type of skills are interviewing skills. The crime scene investigation team needs to interview and interrogate various people at different stages of the investigation. Psychologists have contributed immensely in this field. Just as physical evidence needs to be collected in a scientific manner, similarly, one needs to collect eyewitness evidence in a scientific manner. The last type of skills are reasoning skills. The investigator uses both deductive and inductive skills to reach a conclusion about the crime. Deductive reasoning is a type of reasoning which goes from general to specific, while in inductive reasoning one infers from a specific case to the general principle. The inductive profiling method is based on inductive reasoning. Information from various sources such as clinical observations and interviews about a specific type of crime is collected and analyzed. The profiler then infers from the data obtained 
to similar groups of criminals. For example, many studies indicate that rapists are often well known to the victim. Hence, this is information about specific types of criminals that is rapists. Therefore, it is inferred that the offender for the unsolved rape will most likely be known to the victim. This is a generalization based on specific type of information about rapists. However, these results are very general and one is not sure about them. It may be possible that the rapist is not known to the victim. However, sometimes these kinds of hypotheses are also important. On the other hand, deductive reasoning is used in deductive profiling where the investigators collects a general information about the crime and the profiler draws specific conclusions about the criminal's characteristics. For example, a 20-year-old female is raped in her home during a day when she is on leave from office. The offender wears a mask and calls her name during the rape. This is general information about the crime, inferring from the fact that the offender used her name and wore a mask. The profiler can conclude that the offender is someone that she might recognize. This is specific inference based upon general information about the crime. In his book, Dead Reckoning, The Art of Forensic Detection, Not P, 2002, emphasizes that criminal investigators also need to develop guiding theories about how the crime was committed. These theories need to be very flexible and if the available evidence contradicts it, then the investigator needs to develop a new guiding theory. Now, let us focus on the types of evidence in a criminal investigation. The solving of a crime is highly dependent on the evidence gathered by the investigative team. The crime scene will be the place where most but not all evidence will be located. This evidence can range from tiny hair, which are hardly visible, to the naked eye, to the more conspicuous places of clothing left behind by the assailant. Whatever the case, this evidence often may have a very short life before it either gets destroyed or is contaminated. Hence, it is imperative that it be gathered with utmost care and sincerity so that the evidence can lead to the solution of the crime. There are many ways of classifying the evidence. For example, Buckles 2007 differentiates between two types of evidence, direct evidence and circumstantial evidence. Direct evidence, also referred to as real evidence, proves the disputed fact directly and can be both testimonial and physical evidence. If the witness states in the court that she saw the defendant stab the victim in the stomach, then this would be direct evidence. No intervening deductions are required to prove the disputed fact. Similarly, if someone was to make a confession, then this too would be considered as direct evidence. According to Buckles in 2007, circumstantial evidence on the other hand is indirect evidence, which involves inferences from a series of facts. This too can be both testimonial and physical evidence. Uh. For example, the knife found in the stomach of the victim has the fingerprints of the suspect, then this would constitute circumstantial evidence that links the evidence to the suspect. This link between the defendant and the crime scene was only indirect and it has to be inferred from this evidence that the defendant stabbed the victim. In addition, Buckles 2007 differentiates between four forms of evidence, testimonial evidence, physical, documentary and demonstrative evidence. Testimonial evidence is often the most common and sometimes most controversial evidence as well. This involves eyewitness reports about the crime, but it needs to be remembered that eyewitness accounts are based on memories and these are often subject to distortions. Physical evidence is objective evidence with specific physical dimensions such as size and shape. This includes fingerprints, hair, blood, stains, tire marks and other items. As is clear from the examples that it may be biological or non-biological in nature. Whatever the nature of evidence, all evidence needs to be collected in a scientific manner so that the evidence is uncontaminated. Documentary evidence is in the form of written documents such as letters, notes, pictures, 
that are found at the crime scene or during the investigation. Demonstrative evidence demonstrates or recreates evidence that has already been presented but needs further explanation. This may include sketching and photos of the crime scene, diagrams, etc. Whatever the type and form of evidence, it must have the property of relevancy for it to be admissible in court. In other words, it must be able to prove or disprove something. This requires that it be probative or more probable than not in proving or disproving something. We will now discuss the procedures of crime scene investigation. According to Bertino and Bertino 2012, there are various components of any crime scene investigation. The first component is to maximize safety and security of the scene. Usually, the police are the first to arrive at any crime scene and are therefore referred to as the first responders. The crime scene is dynamic and ever-changing. It is therefore the actions of the first responder which will ultimately dictate whether the crime will be successfully solved or not. The first responding police officer's duty is to ensure the safety and security of all individuals in the area. The area needs to be scanned for any kind of danger. Officers should assess the conditions of the victims and immediately call for medical personnel if required. The first responding police officer also needs to protect the crime scene. The boundaries of the crime scene need to be defined and controlled. In other words, it is important to establish the perimeter and decide what is inside the crime scene and what is outside the crime scene. It is much better to over-define the crime area rather than under-define it. Traffic cones and tapes are usually used to define the boundaries or the perimeter. Multi-level containment can be used also at times. This may have three levels. The first level is the outer perimeter which is accessible only to the media if of course they are present. The second level is inside the outer perimeter adjacent to the crime scene which is accessible only to the police and emergency personnel. It has the command post or the on-scene coordination center. The third level is the inner perimeter which is the actual crime scene. One of the most difficult tasks according to Detail 2013 is to prevent the official sightseers such as government officials, politicians, officers and others who are not directly involved in the crime scene investigation to enter and contaminate the scene. No authorized people should be allowed to enter the scene. In addition, a security log needs to be maintained as to the people who visit the crime scene. Failure to follow these protocols will lead to contamination of evidence and blotching of the case. There have been many media reports about crimes in India where the police was criticized as this first mandatory step had not been undertaken by them. The second component is separating the witnesses Often there will be many witnesses to a crime. Separating these witnesses so that they do not communicate with each other in any way is the next step. There have been many studies which indicate that eyewitnesses memories may change if they are allowed to speak to each other. Co-witnesses may be influenced and influence each other in myriad ways. In one study by Wright et al in 2009, it was found that errors made by one witness were incorporated in the accounts of another witness. Memon and Wright, 1999, cite the famous case of Oklahoma City bombing. There were three witnesses when Timothy McWay rented the truck used in the bombing. At first, the two witnesses thought McWay had been alone. However, subsequent to talking about this with the third witness, who believed that there had been an accomplice, the first two witnesses too came to believe that there had been an accomplice of Megwa. The FBI now thinks that this accomplice was an innocent individual who rented a different truck the following day. The third component is scanning the scene. Both primary and secondary scenes need to be scanned. 
The scene at which the crime took place is referred to as the primary crime scene, while the secondary crime scene is indirectly related to the offence. Usually the first responding officer will be dispatched first to the primary scene. A murder in a room may be the primary scene but the body may have been dropped to the terrace and this therefore becomes the secondary scene. Both may be important depending upon the nature of the crime. The fourth component is seeing the scene. It is important that the crime scene is observed carefully and permanent records of all observations are made. Photos are taken of both the area as well as that of the evidence. These include close-up photographs and photographs from various angles. The technique of triangulation is used commonly for outdoor objects. The fifth component is sketching the scene. A rough sketch of considerable accuracy of the crime scene needs to be made. The aim of such a crime scene sketch is to establish a mental scene or a script for anyone who has not been present in the scene. Hence, it is important that all objects of the area with the precise locations should be included in the sketch. Two fixed stationary landmarks should be used as reference points from which the distance of all objects or evidence should be measured. This sketch will later help in interviewing witnesses and interrogating suspects and also in presenting the case in the court. The sixth component is searching for evidence. In order to search for evidence, a systematic and scientific method needs to be used. Some evidence can be easily found but other evidence requires a lot of systematic effort. The aim of all such methods is that each part of the area which has been searched extremely well. Commonly used methods include geometric patterns such as spiral search, grid method, strip or lin linear search and quadrant or zone pattern. The method used depends on the number of investigators. For example, the linear pattern is often used when in only single investigators are present, while when there are many investigators then quadrant pattern can be used. The seventh component is securing and collecting evidence. Locard's exchange principle states that there is trace evidence to be found at each and every crime scene since the perpetrator of the crime will leave something of himself or herself on the crime scene and take back something as well. Both of these can be used as evidence to solve the crime. While collecting evidence, it is important that it be gathered carefully so that no contamination of evidence takes place. The usual practice is to collect evidence that is particularly fragile or is susceptible to contamination such as blood, fingerprints, shoe prints, etc. Each of these evidences needs to be individually packaged. The kind of evidence will determine what method of packaging should be used. For example, dry trace evidence can be put in pill bottles or envelopes. Liquid evidence needs to be stored in airtight containers. Biological evidence is placed in non-airtight containers so that it can dry. Otherwise, there is a chance that moisture present in the evidence can lead to contamination by mold. It is also important that the evidence log and chain of custody document be attached with the evidence. The evidence pack needs to be marked and initialed by the person who has found the evidence. The eighth component is establishing the chain of custody. The evidence is admissible in court only if the evidence has been kept safe and secure from the crime scene until the courtroom. It is very essential that the chain of custody be kept intact. Once the evidence has been discovered and catalogued, every person who is in the next custodian of the evidence needs to sign it and is responsible for maintaining the integrity of the evidence. The chain of custody may for example begin with the officer who found the evidence to the lab technician and so on. Maintaining the chain of custody is of paramount importance. The ninth and last component is crime scene reconstruction. This involves forming hypotheses about the series of events that could have led to the crime. Physical and scientific evidence is closely looked at with an open mind. Witness statements are critically examined, 
to determine the answer to the question what could have happened and how did it happen. Staged events are particularly difficult to handle. For example, there are numerous accounts where a burglary may have been staged to obtain insurance money. Let us now summarize the module. Criminal investigation involves the use of scientific methods and principles to collect various kinds of evidences with the goal of establishing the series of events surrounding the crime and eventually solving it. It is multidisciplinary in nature as various academic disciplines contribute to criminal investigation. The underlying assumption behind any crime is that while committing a crime, the perpetrator is likely to make an error. This evidence that he has left behind plays an important role in later investigations. Often two types of investigations have been differentiated. The reactive approach to investigation occurs when a police responds to a crime that has already taken place, such as murder or theft. On the other hand, the proactive approach to investigation occurs in response to an ongoing criminal activity or even before the crime has been committed. Crime scene investigation is a highly complex process requiring vast varieties of skills and expertise. The skills that investigators require include technology skills, people skills, managerial skills, interviewing skills and reasoning skills. There are many ways of classifying the evidence. For example, Buckles 2007 differentiates between two types of evidence, direct evidence and circumstantial evidence. In addition, Buckles 2007 differentiates between four forms of evidence, testimonial evidence, physical, documentary and demonstrative evidence. According to Bertino and Bertino 2012, there are various components of any crime scene investigation, maximizing sa safety and securing the scene, separating the witnesses, scanning the scene, seeing the scene, sketching the scene, searching for evidence, securing and collecting evidence, chain of custody and crime scene reconstruction. Thank you.